I think it's time. Welcome back, everybody. Um, so today we're going to talk about the derivative some more. Last time, at the very end, I wrote out some um, simple properties of the derivative about adding two functions together and such. Um, I want to talk in more detail about the product rule, though. That was the third of the things that I wrote at the very end. It says if uh, f and g are differentiable at c, then f times g, the derivative at c, is... Everybody knows the product rule, right? f of c, g prime of c, plus uh, g of c, f prime of c. All right, Or however you like to write. There's many ways you can write that in different orders and such. Um, I want to talk about why this is true. So actually, the the uh, the proof of this is fairly easy to do, and you probably did it in your calculus class. I don't know who your uh, calculus uh, who taught you calculus, but um, probably you uh, talked about this. So um, it, it's not hard. You just have to use the definition of the derivative, and I hope you remember from last time the definition of the derivative. Maybe I'll write that just up here to refresh our memory f prime of c is lim x goes to c f of x minus f of c divided by x minus c, right? This is the definition that our book uses of the derivative. It's equivalent to, a, there's a like x plus h or x plus delta x1, uh, which is equivalent to that. Anyway, let's try it out. So I'm just going to write the left-hand side. fg prime of c is... What do we do? It's lim x goes to c. I'm just uh, looking at this formula up here. Only instead of f, uh, my function is f of x times g of x. So when it says f of x up there, my version of that would be f of x times g of x. Minus when it says f of c up there, what I want to see down here is f of c minus... Oops f of c times g of c, right? Because my function is f times g. And then on the bottom, of course, we have x minus c still. All right. Um, you can do this proof using some simple tricks on this limit here. You don't have to do any epsilons or, or any of that business. Some simple tricks here. The simple trick, it's not... Um, Maybe not obvious to do this, but once you once once it's suggested to you, you will agree that it's going to work. I think. Uh, here's the trick: you go f of x, g of x. This is one of those add and subtract the same thing. I'm going to subtract f of x, g of c, add f of x, g of c, and then finally I have what what we started with at the end there: f of c, g of c. All right, so this this thing in the middle is new. I just inserted that out of nowhere, but that's legal. That that thing in the middle sort of is meant to bridge the gap between these two things. This one has x both times. This one has c both times, and I put this thing, which is sort of like a intermediate, a mixture uh, of the two. Anyway, that's the numerator. Oops, dividing all of this by x minus c. Right. Uh, anybody seen this trick before? Any um, any suggestions about what we can do now? It doesn't matter if you've seen it before or not. Any ideas? No ideas. How about... Um, the, uh, the next thing you want to do is split this big fraction into two parts. You want to group them sort of this way and this way, and then split it up into two fractions, and then maybe you'll see what to do next. f of x, g of x, minus f of x, g of c, over x minus c, plus, and then, you know, this is all inside the limb. f of x, g of c, minus f of c, g of c, over x minus c. What about that? Can we do anything with these? Now I'm going to make you tell me. In the first fraction, we can factor out an f of x at the top 
And then the other one, we can factor out a g of c. Yeah, right. In the numerator of each one, there is a common factor. So in the first one, I'll, leave, I'll just leave my limb out here. Eventually, we'll take the limit by plugging in x equals c. But uh, until then, I factor f of x, like she said, from the first one. And then what remains in the fraction would be g of x minus g of c over x minus c, right? That's the first one. And similarly, the second one we can factor out, but this time it's going to be g of c factors out. And I get f of x minus f of c over x minus c. Okay. And now I'm going to actually do the limit. When I do the limit, what do I get from f of x? Well, that becomes f of c. Um, because I'm replacing the x's by c. Actually, the fact that this limit of f of x equals f of c, that's because, can I write sort of as a, by way of explanation? This is since f is continuous. The fact that f is continuous means when I put um, limit as x goes to c of f of x, you actually get f of c. All right, now, um, if you recall in the beginning, I didn't actually say that f was I didn't actually say that f was continuous in the, in the statement of the theorem. I said it was differentiable. But this is a theorem that we had last time, was that if it's differentiable, that means it's automatically continuous. So um, f is continuous, and I can do that. All right, next, times. What happens to that fraction when x goes to c? Well, if you just look at it, uh, some bad things are going to happen if you just try to plug x equals c in because you get 0 on the bottom, but you also get 0 on the top because those will cancel. Um, actually, you shouldn't really try and think of plugging x equals c into this. Anybody else see what uh, what happens when I take the limit as x approaches c of this thing, g of x minus g of c over x minus c? Does that look like anything? Of c. Uh, it is g prime of c. I think that's what he said. Yeah, this is the derivative of g, isn't it? That like that's the definition of the derivative. When I do this limit to it, it becomes the derivative of g. G prime of c. All right. Because th that is that's what the derivative is. That's the definition. And then plus. All right. Over here, g of c. Actually, this is a limit. Um, whoa. Sorry, this is a limit um, in x, right? So when I do the limit of g of c, that's, that's just a constant as far as this limit is concerned. There's no x in it. And so it remains just g of c. And then what about this fraction? That becomes the derivative of f because uh, that's, that's the definition of the derivative. So I get times f prime of c. All right. And hey, wouldn't you know it, that's the, the product rule formula, right? I started with f g the whole thing prime of c, and uh, this is what it is. That's the product rule. All right. So uh, you, the product rule in this sense is not really a much of a deep fact. It's just you can get it by sort of playing around with the definitions. I mean, it's obviously it's an important fact, but um, it doesn't come from any deep ideas. It's just um, something that you can demonstrate by playing around with the uh, formulas. Any thoughts about that? This is the product rule. You can do a similar trick to prove the quotient rule. I don't think it's worth uh, going through, but you can do a similar kind of add and subtract the same thing. It has to be slightly different for it to work out, but it's it's not um, not not any not appreciably different, right? A similar trick, you get the quotient rule. All right. Um, anybody uh, want to talk about another rule for the derivative? There's one other rule which I do want to talk about. The product rule, the quotient rule, um, are fairly simple, like we just did. The chain rule is the other rule. Did somebody say something? Did you say the chain rule? Yeah, I was just saying the chain rule. Yes, the chain rule. I hope you're all saying in your heart, the chain rule is what we want to talk about next. The chain rule. Let's talk about the chain rule. The chain rule, it turns out, actually, is uh, quite a bit deeper. If you, From a certain point of view, if you ask, like, Someone who does real analysis all the time, it will tell you some some weird on my face. Um, I should stop looking at my face so much. I can't help it. Um, people who do real analysis will tell you the chain rule is deeper than the product rule and the quotient rule. Um, 
uh, it's it's sort of regarded as more important, more fundamental, and um, uh, and you'll see the proof requires a little little more fancy business than this fairly uh, simple proof for the uh, for the product rule. So let's talk about the chain rule. All right, the chain rule, um, you know, is the rule that we all know and love. It says g of f prime of c. I hope you remember the chain rule. Anyone, uh, can you tell me what the chain rule is? Somebody remember? Any calculus tutors out there? I'm sure you remember it. Do you remember the chain rule? Are you all looking around nervously? It's g dash of f of c multiplied by f dash of c. Yeah, so g prime of f of c times f prime of c. This is the chain rule. Um, this one, you, like when you're doing the chain rule in a calculus problem, you usually don't think of it in terms of this formula that you're plugging into, but um, at least I don't. The way I think about it is this means you take the derivative of the function on the outside, you leave the same thing on the inside, and then separately you multiply times the derivative of the function on the inside. That's the chain rule. All right. Um, there is something like an easy proof of this. So I want to give you like the fake proof first, and this will give you the basic idea for why the chain rule is true. But the, actually, the, some of the details don't quite, um, uh, they, they, it seems to work even though the details aren't so clear. So here is the fake proof. So this is like if you're trying to convince your, your uh, younger brother that the chain rule is true. This might be what you say to them. And it's mostly correct what I'm about to say, but there's some details that don't quite work out. Um, so you can try to do this using sort of simple tricks, and here's what it would look like. Um, when I do the derivative of g composed with f, I can use the definition. So I go lim x goes to c. And now I'm going to write the definition of the derivative, but my function this time is g of f. So up here it will say g of f of x minus g of f of c divided by x minus c, right? That is the definition of the derivative. I said this is a fake proof. One of the steps that I write here is not totally legit, but this, this step is legit. This is too legit. Remember that? People used to say legit. And then they stopped saying legit for a couple decades, and now they're saying it again. They're legit saying it again. They say it in a different way now. I try to keep up with the uh, with the young folks um, in their verbiage. Okay, here's the simple trick, all right? In the same vein as the proof of the product rule, you can try to do a similar sort of cute little trick. And here's what it would look like. I'm going to keep the same numerator, but instead of that, I'm going to divide by f of x minus f of c, uh, yes, and then times separately f of x minus f of c over x minus c, all right? This also is a legit step. This is still uh, correct, what I'm writing here. Um, and then the, f the final step, and this is the somewhat bogus step, is now when I do this limit, what does this one at the end go become? It becomes f prime of c, because that's the definition of f prime of c. And this part here becomes g prime of f of c. This is the less legit step, but you should feel on, on some basic level that that should be true. What I have here is g of something minus g of the, the something with the c in it. And then I'm dividing by this this thing and this thing, right? Subtracted. It actually this more or less does fit the format of the derivative of g, if you were plugging in f of c, right? Um, it doesn't quite fit though. This this doesn't exactly match what that's supposed to be, and that's really the obstacle to this uh, proof working correctly. Uh, but this is the basic um, the basic idea or the notion. Um, that the chain rule is based on. Oops, it's multiplication right there, all right?
really, we need to explain this this right here quite a quite a bit more than that. But I wanted to give you sort of the, the simple the simple tricks version of the proof of the chain rule. Um, you might have seen something like this in your calculus class. Probably your calculus class they did not do the real proof of the chain rule. I know. Um, I teach the um, applied calculus class, which is what like the business majors and the um, the nursing uh, majors take it. Um, they don't even do the real proof of the chain rule in the book. I don't. I definitely don't do it in class, and it's not even in the book. The book says it's too hard for us to do. Um, so even uh, a lot of calculus books won't even try to do the real proof of the chain rule. Although it's not. It's not so uh, bad. So I want to. Uh, I think we are sophisticated real analysis students here, I think we can talk about the real proof. So I'm going to write this as a theorem. Oops. This uh, this fake proof, the real proof does more or less follow the same idea. It's just you have to justify that, that, that red arrow that I circled there. So uh, I'm going to write this as a theorem. It is the chain rule, of course. Um, so to write out like with, you know, with uh, as a theorem, I'm going to say let f and g be differentiable and then and and choose some point c in the real numbers then you get this formula oops g compose f prime of c equals g prime f of c times f prime of c all right um and I'm going to begin in the same way. So here's the proof. Uh, we are going to start by just writing out the definition. Since uh, G is differentiable, uh, sorry, G. This is not. Uh, this is not what I wanted to write uh, first. I'm going to focus on this part. Uh, the proof, the real proof, involves looking very carefully at this piece right here because that that piece is really analogous to this this bogus step right here. Uh, which is really what the proof needs to focus on, that, that thing. The rest of it is, is just simple moving stuff around. So we're going to focus on that part of it right there. And um, what is that? We can say using the definition. So let me just say since, oops, since uh, G is differentiable, that means, First of all, you can actually do this derivative. G prime of f of c actually exists, and we can say what it is. It's a limit. G prime of f of c is equal to uh, the limit x goes to c. What really is that? It's the limit as, um, sorry, it's not that, <laughs> can I say? And I'm not even going to use x here. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call it y, and you'll see why in a moment. All right, in this example, what's playing the role, usually what I use, uh, what I write as C, is in this example, the specific point that I'm plugging in is F of C. So when I approach in this limit here, it shouldn't say approaches C, it should say something approaches F of C. And because this is one of the values of F, I'm gonna use Y rather than X. This will be, uh, this, is, this is meant to make the proof uh, a little bit less confusing. If you use X for everything, you can get mixed up about what it represents. So anyway. Uh, the derivative here, the limit as y goes to f of c, and what I should see here is, you know, usually the definition will say f of x minus f of c. This time it needs to say g of y minus g of f of c, right? f of c is the point at which I'm taking the derivative, which usually is c when we write these, and then this is just some other point, which usually is written as x, all right? Uh, and then that is divided by y minus f of c. All right. This is the definition of the derivative g prime of f of c. And you can see why this, when I write it this way, this is what it truly is. And it's not really the same as, as that, right? It's kind of similar, but they're not the same. So you, you can't just uh, plug that in at that step of the proof. Okay, um, we need to talk about this in more detail. Uh, the strategy is just look at this part. I'm going to call this d of y. This We'll treat this as its own thing that we're going to try and discuss in more detail. d, the book calls this d for, they call it the difference quotient. It is a quotient of differences, so they call it the difference quotient. All right, anyway, so d of y, I'm just going to write it. 
is g of y minus g of f of c over y minus f of c. All right. And this d, uh, because g and f are both continuous, this d is also continuous. So this is continuous. Now you might worry about, is it continuous? Oops. This is continuous. Um, what about if this denominator is zero? What about if y actually equals f of c? Is it continuous even then? Well, when y equals f of c, you can still do this limit and you'll get an answer. So I'm going to say this is continuous um, if we let d of f of c, which just strictly according to the formula, that should be undefined because you get zero in the denominator. But if you use the limit as you approach uh, f of c, you actually get something. You get the derivative. So if I let this equal g prime of f of c. All right then this d thing becomes continuous, okay? And we can do some fairly simple tricks with the d to get around this issue uh, with, with the fact that it didn't quite match up in our fake proof. So some simple tricks now. Um, you can multiply the denominator over to the other side. It'll say d, I'm going to write the d first, d of y times y minus f of c is g of y minus g of f of c, right? That's uh, just moving the denominator over. And now this formula will be true for any y. So this is true for all y. All right. Um, and in, in particular, it is true for y equals um, f of x. Like any value of x, when you plug it into f, you can use that as the y. So I'm going to say let y equal f of x and I'm going to rewrite that formula. It says d of f of x. I'm trying to gradually make it look like the thing that was inside that fake proof, which had a f of x in place of y here. So d of f of x times f of x minus f of c equals g of f of x minus g of f of c. And then finally, I can divide through everything by x minus c to make it look exactly like the thing that we were looking um, at before, like to make it look more like a, a derivative. So I'm going to divide by x minus c on both sides. It says d of f of x uh, times the fraction f of x minus f of c over x minus c equals g of f of x minus g of f of c over x minus c. All right. And then, we're almost done here. Uh, finally, I'm going to take the limit as x goes to c throughout. Now you can see, actually, we do indeed have this thing, which will really become the derivative of g, g prime of f of c, when I take the limit. Throughout. So now I'm going to take limit x goes to c of everything, er thing. Take the limit as x goes to c of everything here. The d, if you recall, the limit of the d, uh, this is d, right? You'll have to look up on your page. This is d, and when I take the limit um, of the d, I get g prime of f of c. So this d becomes g prime of f of c. This right here becomes f prime of c. And this right here becomes the derivative of g of f. So g of f prime of c. And that's the chain rule. All right. So uh, this is... Uh, similar, the basic idea of it is similar to that fake proof. It's just you got to be careful about this this D thing. That's really the whole uh, the whole trick of the proof. All right. Any questions about that? I hope you, I hope you were able to follow through that. Um, I, I I know these things can be confusing, but I think really it is sort of a, a moral obligation for you as a math major to actually see the proof of the chain rule for once in your life, right? 
Um, I hope that you, you know, you always believe that the chain rule is true, but this is uh, the effort that it takes to establish the chain rule. It's quite a bit more uh, delicate than the, um, than the product rule. Any questions about that? All right. Now, in a, uh, in a typical calculus class, we would spend the next couple weeks like doing the product rule over and over again and doing the chain rule over and over again. We're just going to skip over that because I assume that you guys um, know how to do all that. Um, we're going to talk about some more sort of classic um, fun facts from calculus. So, uh, and this will include the uh, everybody's favorite... Um, well, I want to talk, I don't know if we're going to get actually to everybody's favorite. I want to talk about the last of the value theorems. There was the um, extreme value theorem, which is about minima and maxima. There's the intermediate value theorem, which is about if, if a function is positive somewhere and negative somewhere else, then it has to be zero in the middle. And there's also the mean value theorem, which is about the derivative, and that's what I want to get to. Although, like I say, maybe this will wait till next time. But a little warm-up to the mean value theorem is another important thing that I'm sure you talked about in calculus. And our book uh, calls this something like the interior, uh, I forget, I didn't write down actually. This is like the interior extreme value theorem or something like that. It says, um, I'm sure that you remember this, this is about relative extrema. And it says if you have some kind of like a closed interval A to B, and a continuous function. So if f is continuous on a closed interval a to b and some interior point is a maximum or minimum. So such a interior, I mean not on the endpoints but on the inside like say here, right? Um, I'll call it C even. Some interior point C is a maximum or a minimum. Then, um, what can you say about the derivative? Sorry, I didn't mean continuous. I meant differentiable. This really requires the derivative. Uh, then, um, the derivative is zero. This is a fact that you use all the time, and it's the basis of like one of the types of things that you do in a calculus class, where... Um, if you are looking for minima or maxima of a function, then it suffices to look for where the derivative equals zero. Or, uh, usually in a calculus class we say either where the derivative is zero or where the derivative does not exist. But because we are um, assuming that the function is differentiable, then that means the derivative always exists. And so the only other option would be that the derivative is zero. So a relative uh, minimum or maximum uh, on the inside of, a, of an interval, not on the end, is always a place where the derivative is zero. Those are called the critical points or the critical numbers uh, sometimes. I hope that this is familiar. A blast from your past as a calculus student. Um, let's see if we can do this. This is not so hard to demonstrate. Um, I'm going to write it as a theorem. So I'll say let f be differentiable. Actually, I'm going to write more or less the same thing that I just wrote. differentiable on a closed interval a to b and say that uh, I'm gonna say this way f of c is a maximum or minimum it the it's the same either way a maximum or minimum uh, among all values in uh, A to B. Where, you know, C is in the open interval A to B. So C is not on one of the endpoints, but its value is either bigger than all the others or less than all the others. By max or minimum, it could be greater or equal to uh, some of the others. All right. Then... Uh, f prime of c equals zero. All right. If it's a maximum or a minimum, then the derivative must be zero at that point. All right. 
I'm sure that you talked about this in your calculus class. And, uh, you know, in the calculus class, typically you, you spend a lot of time, like, doing examples. I give you 10 different example functions, and you find for me the values where the derivative is 0, and then determine if it's a maximum or a minimum. We're going to skip the examples, as usual, um, uh, because they're, they're pretty simple to do, usually, once you know how to do it. Anyway, let's, uh, let's see if we can do this. The, uh, the proof of this is, uh, is very intuitive by looking at the picture, although I don't know if you ever really thought about how you, would, how you would explain exactly why the derivative has to be zero there. Anyway, let's say that um, C is a maximum. So the proof really goes the same way if it's a maximum versus a minimum. Uh, you'll be able to see very easily w at what point, if it were a minimum, like you, you change all the less thans to greater thans. And it, the same proof works. So let's just do it for a maximum. Um, for C in the open interval, A to B. All right. Um, and what I want to show is F prime of C is zero. Of course, that, is, that means F prime of C is this limit, right? Limit as X goes to C of uh, F of X minus F of C divided by X minus C, right? I want to show that this equals zero. Okay. <clears throat> uh, we're going to do this using sequences. I have a limit, which I want to show equals zero. Now, first of all, the limit does exist, right? We already know the limit does exist because f is differentiable uh, on the interval. So it is, uh, it is going to be differentiable at c automatically. So the, um, the, uh, the limit does exist. It's just a matter of showing that it equals zero. And we can do this using sequences. The fact that the limit exists, the limit of this function, this means since the limit as x goes to c exists, exists, I put a strange, I put a comma in the middle of the word. Since the limit as x goes to c exists, um, we can use sequences. What I mean by that is if xn approaches c, then lim f of xn minus f of c over xn minus c exists, right? Where this lim, I didn't write any uh, little little guy here. That's because this is not, not the limit of a function, but I'm talking about the limit of a sequence here. If you take any sequence of points going to c, then the limit of this as a sequence exists. And in fact, it, it must equal whatever this function's limit is, all right? So this I'm talking about, the limit of a sequence. If you want, just for emphasis, you could say this, I mean limit as n goes to infinity, all right? And the way we're gonna do this is try to choose some, uh, a sequence of points where the limit is gonna be positive and another sequence of points where the limit is gonna be negative. Uh, keeping in mind the picture here, right? I have a to b, something like that. My graph is something like this, right? And here's the C, the maximum. Um, I want to use, uh, I'm gonna use two sequences, one of which uh, has values which are positive, the other which has values which are negative. Um, and uh, the way that I'm gonna do this, you know, the values I'm plugging into are basically gonna be these uh, slopes near C. And if I come this way, I hope you agree, if I choose points coming this way, approaching C from the left, those slopes should all be positive, shouldn't they? And if I choose points approaching C from the right, those slopes should all be negative because it's, it's going down like this, right? Like when you judge the slope, you should look from left to right. If I choose points to the, to the right of C, those slopes should all be negative. The slopes to the left of C should all be positive. So I'm gonna choose a sequence approaching C from the left and another sequence approaching C from the right and we, I use my favorite sequence is, um, you know, C plus one over N or something like that. You, you don't really have to say what it is. I'm just gonna say, choose some XN, this is a sequence in the open interval A to B, where XN converges to C and XN is less than or equal to C for all N, all right? So xn would be points like this, coming in from the left. You can use basically like c minus one over n would, would work for this. Um, 
This, by the way, is where we use the fact that c is on the inside of the interval. If c was on the end, uh, then this may not be possible, because if c is like on the left side on the end, then you can't find a, a sequence inside the interval approaching from the left. All right, and then I'm going to choose, uh, I'll call yn the other ones. yn in the interval a to b. And also make another sequence where yn approaches c and yn's are greater than c. So this is the, uh, the sequence which is approaching from the right side. So these guys here are the xn, and these guys over here are the yn. All right. And now I'm going to plug into that sort of derivative-like formula. So I can say then lim x, sorry, lim n goes to infinity. I'm, I'm plugging them into this thing, all right? Um, I'm using, I'm going to use xn first and then also yn. What can we say about that? Lim n goes to infinity, f of xn minus f of c huh? over xn minus c, right? Um, I want to say what this is. Is it positive or negative or something? Can we say anything like that? Well, when I look at the um, fraction here, um, What do you say? On the bottom, xn minus c, can anybody say, is that positive or negative? The, recall this is uh, the definition of the xn's. What is xn minus c? Is that going to be positive or negative? Negative. It will be negative because xn is less than c, right? So on the bottom, it's negative because I said over here, xn is less than or equal to c. So the bottom will be negative. And what about the top? The top is f of xn minus f of c. Now, we don't know really much of anything about f, but we know that f of c is the maximum value. And so the top also is negative. Whoop, switch to red. All right, the top is also negative. That's because f of c is the maximum value. Uh, which means f of xn has got to be less than f of c. So when I subtract, I get a negative. All right. And so, uh, switching my colors. This is positive, right? So that means lim n goes to infinity, f of xn minus f of c over xn minus c is greater than or equal to zero. All right. It could be zero, all these things that I'm talking about, they could be zero if, if f of c is actually equal to f of xn, then the top could be zero. But anyway, the limit is greater than or equal to zero. That means that f prime, that's what this is, f prime of c is greater or equal to zero. Remember, we're, our goal is to show that it actually equals zero. So far, we've shown that it is greater or equal to zero. But if you do the same business with the y's, you get the fact that it's less than or equal to zero. So same for the y's. Similarly for y n. What do we get? We get lim n goes to infinity f of y n minus f of c over y n minus c. What's that? This is going to be um, the bottom this time will be positive, right? Because y n is bigger than c, right? That's what we set up here. y n greater than or equal to c. What about the top? Is that positive or negative? It is, again, negative. I don't know if you thought both would be the opposite. They're not. The bottom is the opposite. Yn is bigger than c. But the top is, again, negative because f of c is the maximum possible value. And so the f of yn cannot be bigger than f of c. So the bottom is, again, huh, negative. So this is a negative. So f prime of c is less than or equal to zero. And that, my friends, put these two together, it means f, of c, f prime of c actually equals zero. Equals zero, straight up. All right, and that's the end. So uh, this on the, on the picture, the idea is if I use xn's like this, 
then the slopes there will all be positive. If I use y ends like this, the slopes there will all be negative. And that's what that's what I said before. And so if the uh, that point right in the middle, it has to be positive or perhaps zero, but it also has to be negative or perhaps zero. And so the only option is it really is uh, really is zero. All right. This is the interior extreme value theorem. Some, that's what the book calls it, something like that. I would refer to this as that thing that says the derivative has to be zero when it's a uh, relative minimum or maximum. Any questions about that one? All right. Uh, we got nine minutes left on the clock. Uh, maybe we'll do just a little introduction to the mean value theorem, and that's what I really want to talk about next time. The mean value theorem. The mean value theorem. Um, this is the last of the big, you know, value theorems from calculus. May, uh, maybe the last. I think. I think so. Um, the mean value theorem, it's the, this is the one uh, concerning the derivative, so it's about the average slope um, and its relation to the slope at a point. And the picture that you should have in mind concerning the mean value theorem is like this. If I have some function on an interval from A to B, and let's say it looks like this when you draw the graph. Here's f of a, here's f of b up here. The mean value theorem says that if you look at the average slope from a to b, which is the slope of this line, uh, this right here is the average slope um, from a to b. Average, uh, in other words, mean. This is why it's called the mean value theorem. Um, anybody remember the conclusion of this? If you consider the average slope, um, and it, it is related to the slope at a particular point. Does anyone remember? Have you stopped paying attention because I did too many proofs? Sorry, right. I'm not going to do any more proofs in the next five minutes. Remember what the mean value theorem says? It says, uh, it says that there is a point inside the interval where the slope at that point equals that average slope. So it's about the average slope and the slope at a point. So this is the average slope at a point. And the theorem is that there exists a point C in the interval A to B with F prime of C equals the average slope. I'll write this in more detail uh, next time. But uh, can you see a point inside the interval where the slope at the point, um, the you know instantaneous slope, is equal to the average slope? Actually, I can see two such points. There's one maybe here which has slope there, which is the same as the average slope. And then there's one sort of up here somewhere. I'm just eyeballing it, where the slope up there is the same as the average slope. If you have a certain average slope computed by just snapshotting the, the values in the, at the beginning and the end, then there are interior points at which your slope at that moment is equal to the average slope. All right. The mean value theorem actually um, can be used in the real world. Uh, people, uh, I, I hear every so often about the mean value theorem used um, for giving out speeding tickets. This is a thing you can do, which uh, I think has been tried in the United States, but uh, has been subject to like legal challenges. I think the lawyers disagree about whether this is legal or not. But um, uh, you can, for instance, using, uh, like if you're driving on the highway and there's these like easy pass things, you could go through one easy pass thing and then drive for an hour and then you'll go through another one after a while on a road which has them um, to pay your, pay your tolls, right? They charge you 50 cents or something when you go through one of these uh, gates. Um, but here's the thing, 
if you do that, I had a I had a friend once who said who refused to get an easy pass. He said, because that's how they track you. They can track you. I thought, um, nobody wants to track you, Jason. No one is interested in tracking my friend Jason. But uh, anyway, um, they can track you with the easy pass. They know what time you drove through one gate, and they know what time you drove through the uh, the gate at the end. All right? And it is possible. They, they can just look at the times. I mean, they can do this automatically by a computer, right? With a computer. Um, they can compute what was your average speed as you drove between these two uh, easy pass gates. And maybe your average speed was like 70 miles an hour, which is above the speed limit. And so they can send you a ticket, even though they never, uh, they never like, had a policeman you know, with a radar gun or anything like that. Uh, they just measured your average speed, and um, they give you a ticket for that. Uh, anybody ever heard of this before? Has this ever happened to you? happened to my dad. Really? With the easy pass thing? Yeah, he tends to speed a lot. Where and, was he? Um, he was in uh, New York. He was like on his way to work and he was speeding and he had to go through an easy pass twice. Uh -huh. All right. I didn't know they actually did that in New York. So I think um, people have contested this um, legally and said, you can't give me a ticket unless you actually observe me violating the speed limit. And like it, it, it may be like that your dad, like at the moment that he was going through that gate, maybe he wasn't speeding. And at the moment he went through the other gate, maybe he wasn't speeding. Like there was no actual time when they measured his car going above the speed limit. Um, how do they know that he actually exceeded the speed limit? Actually, it's because of the mean value theorem. Uh, whatever his average speed was, if you believe in the mean value theorem, it means there must have been an individual point at which he really was going um, above the speed limit. If your average is above the speed limit, then there must have been a specific point at which you were going above the speed limit. This is what the mean value theorem means. Um, and I think, uh, I think it's, it's like legally dubious when they do this, or there may be different laws in different states, uh, because there is some general principle that the police have to actually observe you violating the speed limit in order for you to, to be penalized for it. Um, but, you know, using the mean value theorem, the police can mathematically prove that you must have violated the speed limit, which I suppose is, is good enough uh, in some states. Um, I, re I recall, uh, I don't know if you follow, like, Connecticut politics. The governor of Connecticut, Mr. Ned Lamont, from time to time, suggests that we should have tolls on uh, on 95 going through Connecticut. And um, one thing that I saw somebody brought up once, they asked uh, Ned Lamont, like people, um, people in the state of Connecticut, some people really hate this idea because they don't want to pay their 50 cents every, uh, every 50 miles or something. Um, they asked him, hey, uh, are you going to use the easy pass system to send out speeding tickets? Um, and Ned Lamont said, no, 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 no. We're not going to do that. It's just for paying tolls. We're not going to uh, use it for anything else. And they said, well, wh how, do we, how do we know you're not going to do that? Um, and he said, I promise you we're not going to do that, which I thought was funny because it means nothing. Thanks, Ned. Um, Ned told us he... Uh, he said, cross my heart, I'm not going to use the mean value theorem on the uh, easy pass in the state of Connecticut. Um, I don't know Ned personally. I wasn't very encouraged by that. All right, uh, I, think, I think I've exhausted our remaining time. So this is what we're going to talk about next time, the mean value theorem. It is uh, something that on some level, everybody kind of, kind of agrees with this mathematical theorem because of the... Uh, the reasoning with the easy pass seems more or less reasonable to people. So they must, they must know about the mean value theorem deep down in their hearts, even if they don't know how to state it and prove it. All right, I think that'll do for today. Sorry for all the proofs. It's good for, good for the character. Um, I'll see you all on Friday.